summertime and the weather is hot. Hello and welcome to BC Adventure Smart. I am Scott Montague from Coquitlam Search and Rescue, and I'm going to be keeping things running through the computers today. Got some good news for you. If you stick around to the end, you're going to be able to get a chance to win one of the prizes from our sponsors, Hill Sound or Bright Source. And everyone is going to be able to go home with a freebie from our sponsor, Fat Map. Your mics and cameras are off for the session. But we still want to hear your comments and questions. On your screen is a question mark button or a question box. Use it to tell us anything that you want. Uh, ask a question online. It, use the Q&A button actually there. Uh, and we'll do that. And also, I might be going into the chat and putting some various things in there for you to uh, munch on throughout the session. In fact, uh, there's also this little section called reactions. Could you go down there right now? And if you know the general area that this picture was taken, I'll give you a chance to look at it. You can tell me the general area that this picture was taken. Give me a thumbs up. If you can't, just give me a smiley face. Go ahead and hit your reactions there. Oh, no one can. Oh, no one can give me. Wow. Okay. Well, this is still in British Columbia. This is in Glacier National Park. So there you go. If anyone's visited Glacier National Park, it's one of the most gorgeous places in the country. We are really fortunate to have the executive director of BC Adventure Smart uh, leading us through a session that will essentially let us know how we can hike here safely. Seen her on TV, on radio, interviews in the paper. Uh, she's been at it for like 19 years now, almost 20. Uh, she's been with Adventure Smart, but she she has experience well beyond that. Uh, she's been working with uh, outdoor recreation. She spent time as a park ranger. Uh, she's been involved in incident prevention. Uh, and of course, today she works with all of our 78 search and rescue groups uh, across British Columbia. She works with industry partners. She works with people who own land like BC Hydro and other things like that. Uh, and destination marketing agencies, tourism agencies, you see her everywhere with, and they all have the one goal, which is to reduce the number and severity of incidents in British Columbia and across Canada. So at this point in time, I would love you all to give a big welcome maybe put those claps in the in the uh, reactions as i introduce you to the executive director of bc adventure smart the reigning queen of sar prevention in this province sandra riches thank you scott and thank you for all the claps everyone i really appreciate the the lengthy detailed introduction but for those of you who don't know me scott's really covered it all i've i've had the fortunate, uh, uh, many fortunate opportunities to to do exactly what Scott mentioned. I've worn a Stetson as a park ranger. I've worked at the Justice Institute of BC, and mainly for the the chunk of my career, after studying outdoor recreation management early on at Capilano University, I've been with the BC Search and Rescue Association for almost two decades now, 
and work with a team here of uh, professionals. There's six of us that are paid staff, but we're here to support you as enthusiasts, but also to support the search and rescue volunteers. Scott is one of them uh, who belong to the 78 search and rescue groups. And we're gonna share some numbers with you tonight, some stats. Tonight is all about you though, and how you can prepare for yourself, your group, your adventures throughout the summer and into the fall. Fall is an awesome time to go hiking. And this will allow you to get prepared for that. Uh, we'd love to learn where you love to recreate. Uh, Scott just tossed up a little poll if you could fill out that and let us know where you like to most often spend time in the backcountry. We've got Coast Mountains, Vancouver Island, Thompson Okanagan, it's a wonderful, beautiful spot, Caribou Chilcotin Coast, Kootenai Rockies, or Northern BC. The North has so much to offer. Meanwhile, most of us live in the south, the west and southeast. Our province is a large one and we're an active, healthy one. There's no question about that. Coast mountains, we've got a high percentage, mostly there. I still see some numbers coming in. And uh, Vancouver Island is a beautiful, beautiful spot. Lots of good mountain biking over there. If you get a chance to do any of that, which I love to, it's a great spot to ride. Cumberland's in my top 10, in my top five, actually. And 15% of people are joining us from outside BC. Ah. Even better, that's great. You know, Adventure Smart is a national program started in British Columbia, and I'll jump into this in two seconds, but we're here for everyone. No matter where you come from, where you live, this message is universal, it really is, and it can help you prepare for your activities wherever you live in the world. We've had joint, people join us from all over. Um, our goal, our focus, our mission, um, and visions are to help reduce the number and severity of search and rescue calls in British Columbia and throughout Canada, but our sector here is primarily in BC. And it's a busy one. It's actually one that has more search and rescue calls than anywhere else in the, in the country. So without further ado, why don't I jump in for the main reason that you joined me here tonight and Scott, and let's talk a little bit about how you can survive outside. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a weighted title to this program, I, I feel, but it also makes you think, I hope, and it allows you to spend some time on, on the what ifs and, and uh, those emergency situations. And we're gonna talk a lot about that tonight. Scott's got some in the field, actual hands-on experience. He can share some stories and, and, and perceptions, perspectives, pardon me, from the response side. I can talk about that as well a little bit too, plus all of the prevention and, and collaborations. But the idea is all about outdoor safety and how you will apply moving forward. And I'm sure you have some great practices already for your adventures ahead. In 2004, the BC Search and Rescue Association started the Adventure Smart program. And based on its provincial success, it went national um, in 2009. So there is representation in every province and territory. There's a coordinator in every province and territory. There's volunteer outdoor educators in every province and territory. In British Columbia, we have over 500 volunteers who work specifically, volunteer, I should say, with BC Adventure Smart, helping us share these programs, curriculum, working at parks, working as ambassadors, their teachers, their search and rescue volunteers, their tourism ambassadors, um, destination marketing organizations, land managers, the list goes on. Uh, we do training for that twice a year. So if that's of interest, feel free to get in touch. The main focus though, wherever you go, if you're in Newfoundland, in Atlin, BC, or on the island over in Tofino, if you hear this message, and this is what we'd love you to apply, is what we call the three T's. It's really the trifecta of outdoor safety, trip planning, training, and taking the essentials. We're going to jump into the deep sections of that tonight and, and really explain and answer any of your questions as we move through tonight's session. So let's start with that first T. Um, maybe you can give me a thumbs up through the reactions if, if trip planning is something you do for every single adventure. Uh, it's, it's just every a single adventure, Sandra, Scott, you got it. Every single adventure. That's, that's the whole idea. I don't know if I could do it every <laughs> single adventure. 90% of the, okay. If, if you can go, if you can go 90% of the time, let's, let's give a, a heart or something like that. 90% okay, of your adventures, see. you do trip planning. You're giving, okay. Uh, everyone, a really good chance here. I like your approach. Maybe, maybe <laughs> I was shooting too high there, uh, but I, I see some thumbs up and I see some hearts, and that's great. You know, the idea is to think about it. The idea is to jump into the details of it, and tonight we can remind you or introduce you to it. 
and about it. It is essential though, and it's something that we encourage you to do for everyone. Yes, Scott, everyone uh, out there, no matter how big or small the adventure is, we've divided it into four simple sections, which we'll jump into here shortly. But to plan that route and navigation is critical. Knowing the terrain and the conditions is our responsibility to look into, especially as we move through the seasons and they change with climate change, uh, checking the weather in major detail and leaving a comprehensive trip plan with a trusted emergency contact. We'll also talk about that shortly. And, and feel free to, to think about who that person is if you have one already and you have a good relationship or rapport or who it could be if you haven't picked one out yet. Planning your route and your navigation is, is really helpful for those of the likes of Scott who belongs with, to Coquitlam Search and Rescue and all of the other 3,400 search and rescue volunteers in British Columbia. If you trip planned and did all the details of this, it really will help them help you faster, which reduces the severity of a call. So deciding on what trail you're gonna go on uh, based on its difficulty and reconcile that with you and your group's abilities, skills, your talents, your training, how you've been mentored, really figure that out as you search up these, these trails and how does it work against your abilities uh, for that time of the season. I know I'm in much better shape mountain biking at the end of the summer than at the beginning. So there's a few things to think about knowing the limit and planning within it. So I depend I depend that on who I'm going with and we travel as fast as the slowest person in that group, no matter the activity. So we're gonna work together as a team and the group dynamics is a key one. Uh, I'm not just out to reach that peak for me, even though I have eight other people with me. It's a group effort, it's group support. And that dan dynamics need to be a collective and talked about. So know your limits as a group and share honestly what yours are as an individual in that group, your pluses and your challenges. Estimating that time, we have a good chunk of time right now based on daylight with summer still being um, available with more light right now. So plan within that, that range of daylight and make sure you're back to the trailhead, your car home by sunset. We have a lot of commonalities in search and rescue and we collect stats on every single search and rescue call in the province. And every year there's about 1,500 search and rescue calls, 1,500. And the top three reasons, um, and, and uh, the second most common one here is getting lost or disoriented. And that's the second most common. The first one's injury. And the third one is exceeding abilities. So a lot to think about as we go through tonight's session, but the really helpful tips to kind of remind you again, the level of detail search and rescue and you need to do before you head out. Paying close attention to that trail difficulty, that's a good one. You know, if Scott and I are at the same ability when we went for a hike, uh, we would know this prior and we would choose the trail accordingly. Here's a little bit of comparisons here. We've got Burnaby Lake Park Trail, gives you a bit of a visual, gives you the, the length at 10K, and it also talks about the, the hours it would take, about two and a half hours. The visuals there, easy, well-groomed. And on the right, it shows you the kilometers again and the elevation gain. Elevation gain is a kicker. That's really important to remember what that means, how far of a distance it is, if you're capable of doing it, and how you would read that on a map or a description. If we come down to bottom left for Sigurd Peak, we've got 14K, so not much longer, uh, but it's eight hours and completely different terrain. Look at that. Uh, definitely route finding, different gear required, skills needed, and uh, definitely some training there and, and route finding and nav and, and a little bit more. A uh, higher level of skill there. And if we pop over to the topographical map, bottom right, 14K again, but it gives you that elevation gain, almost 2,000 meters. That's a lot of elevation gain, and there's a lot to consider there. Conditions, your abilities, uh, your intake, your energy level, your mental wellness, and elevation gain against the weather and how that temperature will alter. So the, the weather detail is key. I think we're all pretty good at checking the weather app on our phones, looking out the window. Uh, go another level and really look at those temperature gradients and see when it's going to fluctuate, the likelihood of precipitation and when that will happen as well. Because you could still probably get your activity in if you can fit it in the window with a little grace. Wind speed will be a factor as you gain elevation. Uh, precipitation amounts, what's gonna fall, wind, sleet, snow. Uh, let's, let's pay close attention to that 
and a sunset time is critical, no matter the season. On a general rule, on a clear day, when everything aligns really well, the temperature will decrease about 10 degrees for every thousand meters that you gain elevation. And the reason we bring that up is because I want to go back for a second and think about that Sigurd Peak uh, discussion we had two slides ago. 14K, eight hours, and that 2,000 meters elevation. So that's roughly, rough math, easy math, about 20 degrees difference. And the reason we talk about that is, I'm sure we all realize that will happen, but let's say uh, Scott and I and three others are out for a hike and I twist my ankle badly at that 2000 meter elevation and it's 6 p.m. and sun setting at 6.30. Now we have a situation where it's going to be, if it isn't already 20 degrees cooler as it gets into the evening. And we have to manage that situation now with an injury, we need to communicate, uh, keep warm and dry, fed, hydrated. We need to create some visual attraction for search and rescue to see us. There's a lot more that comes into that play. And the temperature is a big one. Search and rescue volunteers have shared many times with me, you know, when they rescue hikers or subjects, the subjects are often surprised, even though we know this, at how much colder it was than they thought it was going to be, or how much darker it actually was than they thought it was going to be. But that's why we're all here tonight, so we can talk about it. We talked earlier a little bit about leaving a comprehensive trip plan with a trusted emergency contact. For lack of breaking every rule on a slide here with way too many words and bullets, I'll shrink it down to the five W's and the H. You know, if something unexpected happens, this information, a trusted contact, will make a difference. It will because the time frame would be less for search and rescue to find you because you've left all this detail with them. Uh, what they're coming to, knowing your abilities, your gear, what you have, um, uh, the food you might've carried, uh, how you hydrated and how you hydrate, all of this information, it's like a big puzzle. And what it does is it allows search and rescue to put this piece of puzzle together to find you in the fastest, most efficient, safe way. That's a biggie. You know, a simple text will do. You can send this off to your emergency contact via text. I think a lot of us use that, if not everybody, every day. Uh, Scott and I do. We know that for sure. Even in prep for this, we do. But it can also be used for uh, leaving a trip plan. But the more information, the better is the most beneficial approach here. So why are you going? Uh, mushroom picking, hiking, skiing, mountain biking. The whys are important. The whens, the details of that time, the departure time and the return time. In this little text demo, we've got a 7 a.m. Uh, heading up to Garibaldi Lake, finished by four. So there's some timelines there. The specifics of where is key. Uh, we're gonna head from Rubble Creek Park Car Park and we're gonna head up to the lake campsite and return on the same trail. There's a really nice piece of information there. That return route is super awesome. The color of the clothing. I'm in, a, in the absolute wrong color tonight. Uh, you wanna be in bright, bold, vibrant, and that, and that goes into your trip plan as well. Don't just assume anyone will see you walking out of the house with the colors you're wearing. Write it down, text it to a friend, let them know, grab a note, stick it on the fridge, on the counter, leave it in the car if you have to. Search and rescue will. I was just talking about this with our team today about one of our coworkers that, that went into a, a car of a subject and found information in there about their whereabouts and them. The idea is to leave one. The idea is to leave one. And then how? How are you getting to and from? Is there vehicle, transport, drop off, uh, two cars, one at either end, depending on the route you're choosing? Did you take transit? Transit does lead us to some pretty great terrain, especially in the southwest of BC. Uh, it makes things very accessible. So here's an example, and, and uh, it's a good one. And we have a video at the end of our presentation tonight. So stick around and you'll learn a little bit more about um, our trip plan app and you can connect to it with our QR code. So Adventure Smart has a, an app that you can download. It's free of charge. It's available to anyone in Canada, and it will allow you to do all of this on the app. Just fill in the fields. If you're still confused after tonight what a trip plan is, the app will make it easy and allow you just to fill in the fields with names, numbers, contacts, everything we've talked about here, and send it to an emergency contact. It's an awesome, awesome app. Feel free to reach out to us if you have questions on that. Training is big. Can I have a clap of hands if anyone has done uh, some training for your summer activities? 
It could be first aid. It could be going to the gym. Uh, it could be studying map and compass. Uh, I see some hands there. That's awesome. It's awesome. We've broken it down into a few categories here, and there, there's more than this. We know that. You do. I do, depending on what you choose to do, when you choose to do it, um, and the level of the activity that you choose. So activity-specific skills in the summertime could be mountain bike course. I took a few years ago to go for a ride and just kind of sharpen my pencil for riding. It was a great course. It was awesome. It was a group of us, five or six. We learned some drops and small jumps, nothing major, uh, but it allowed us to work on technique. So it was perfect. Winter time, a great example of this is an avalanche skills training course. Uh, so activity specific skills training, physical fitness, going to the gym, like I mentioned before, uh, your runs from the house, your workout, your yogas, all of that is key. And, and keeping up with that so that when you get to your sport of choice, that you're ready for it and that it doesn't take too much time to get into the swing of things. I always like to add mental fitness here too. It's a biggie because this is where we need to make sound decisions and use sound judgment pre, during, and post activity. So in that emergency, that sound judgment, that, that grounded decision-making, that risk assessment and the management of your situation will make a huge difference in your, in your decision. So physical fitness and mental fitness, I always like to toss it in. Navigation and route finding. If you know how to use a map and compass, I'll clap back to you. That's awesome. Uh, and knowing how to route find and is key. You know, getting lost and disoriented is our second most common reason for search and rescue. So if you can navigate, you can mitigate one of the top three reasons for search and rescue. Wilderness first aid training. Any first aid training will work, but bushcraft is also amazing to have under your belt and fun to take. Uh, wilderness first aid allows you to work with those different um, um, items in the forest and really apply them in the field. I remember taking that course a number of times. It's really awesome. Uh, and then rescue and emergency training. You can expand on that. Tonight is, is part of that. I always like to say you're increasing your awareness about an emergency situation. You're getting some training tonight. And, and how you can manage a rescue situation, but you can definitely expand on that throughout the summer, spring, winter, and fall. Let's talk about those essentials that we should all be carrying. Uh, and here I'd love a smiley face if you could uh, hit that um, uh, reaction and let me know if you take essentials with you. I won't say all like I did with the other question. Do you take some essentials with you? Do you take some in your backpack? Um, and, and some that go along with you. It could be food, it could be water, just a few things. So I see a lot of reactions going. Essentials do, do not necessarily include like a full bottle of wine. No, not for the, not, not, no. We, that's another presentation altogether, I think, Scott. We have to put that one together for another night. These essentials will help you get out of a pickle, help you reduce the number and severity of search and rescue calls. But I saw some uh, reactions going up. That's awesome. We're going to talk and jump into the essentials, the basics, uh, and then the season and sports specific. That's, that's to me, the icing on the cake of these essentials. We still need to add more, right? People for years have talked about the 10 essential and we've, we've, we've rephrased it really. Um, that's why we say the three T's, trip planning, training, taking the essentials. There's not just 10. There's, there's the basics, and then you have to, and we need to add season and sport specific. Over the years, we've had outreach teams travel the province and deliver face-to-face -face, um, programs like this in schools, uh, workplaces, lunch and learns, at trailheads, at events, at conferences. And we often hear people say, oh my goodness, uh, all of this seems like a lot to pack and carry. So we've made it simple for you and you can put all of this in a little red, red stuff sack. So that's what we've given you a visual as well. So that headlamp and flashlight is key. The light source is one of the giveaways tonight, by the way. Uh, so a headlamp and a flash, flashlight is critical. Uh, you will need a light source and that's not your phone. So the light source is often a headlamp, which is awesome, your hands are free. Don't forget those extra batteries that you carry with you, spares. Fire starting kit. Um, and I know it's a tumultuous fire season right now in British Columbia, so we have to be very careful and cognizant of that. That kit can still be in your pack yeah, if the time is right and if the conditions are safe at certain times of the year, that's something that could be used for warmth and or signaling. 
a signaling device that could be a safety whistle that's on the shoulder pack of your pack, shoulder strap, pardon me, the zipper of your coat, really accessible. And that's a really loud piercing sound uh, that search and rescue can hear because our, our voice will get really muffled outside in the forest, the wind, the weather, uh, rain possibly, the trees, it just soaks up our voice. Uh, so that whistle be, is a great one to have if you don't have one already. First aid kit and pocket knife for obvious reasons, applications of first aid and that knife will come in handy for that as well, but also for making kindling, uh, first aid, possibly making food, and it's gonna, it's gonna come in helpful. Sun protection and emergency shelter. We've done the check marks on it because it easily fits in that sack. And then the remaining ones, extra food and water, of course, one extra liter per person, by the way, that would be your extra ration. So you have your hydration pack or your camelback is your hydration and then carry at least one extra liter per person uh, and some extra food. Bring high calorie food. Look for the highest calorie bar you can find at your outdoor store. They, they, they really stock them up great. They're small to pack, they're light and they pack a punch with calories. Extra warm clothing and waterproof clothing. Yeah, those extra layers are key. Puffy jacket can really roll up tight and small and get stuffed into your backpack. And then you've got it when you put it on. It's just, you'll be so grateful you've got it. And navigation and communication. So that's the foundation. Consider all these essentials here as the foundation in your pack. Uh, like the foundation in your house, it stays there. It's steady. It's, it's, it's relied upon. And so are these essentials. You might just refresh them uh, in the season, depending on if you used any of them throughout. Obviously, the food and water you want to refresh. Uh, season and sport specific, especially spring, late spring, uh, early fall and fall. An example here in the picture is some micro spikes that are perfect to strap on to your hiking shoes, boots. Great traction, right? So that's an example of season and sport specific gear. A few additional pieces here. And again, these are just some of them, but it gives you a visual. The top left shows us the, the essentials. That's the foundation that we just talked about. But for a multi-day, of course, you're gonna have a tent, you need a shelter of some sort, your sleeping bag, uh, sleeping mattress, water purification, that could be tablets um, uh, or water purification unit, that extra clothing, don't forget those extra socks, hat, gloves, and all the right material, which we'll talk about shortly, stove and gas. So these are, these are additional pieces, of course, right? And again, there's more to this, I know, but these are just some examples. Climbing, we've got the helmet, harness, rope, rock protection. But in these few slides, I want to really make the point that the top left doesn't change. That stays the same, always. Again, that's the foundation. The foundation doesn't change on our home uh, and either do the essentials. So really get in an excellent habit of always taking those with you and encourage your fellow friends and hikers and family little people in your life who are just starting out, make it a habit, make this habitual so that it doesn't have to be learned later because it's hard to teach old dogs new tricks. Uh, backcountry skiing, here's a few extras. If we, if we call, um, if we talk about bringing, getting into the winter season, you know, avalanche transceiver, shovel probe, skis, gloves, uh, these extra pieces, helmet, uh, you know, these are some pieces that would definitely fold into that uh, winter season. And again, those essentials don't change. They, they stay there. So I think you got a good gist about that with those ones. Um, what I'd like to jump into here now is another phase of this presentation. So we've talked about the three T's, trip planning, training, and taking the essentials. And now what do we do in an emergency? So a few stats to share with you again, uh, as we'll reference them in this section, because I really like this section. So in British Columbia, we've got 78 search and rescue groups. Uh, there's 3,400 search and rescue volunteers. Scott is one of those 3,400. And they're all unpaid professionals, by the way. I'm paid to do what I do. Scott is a wonderful, amazing volunteer that helps us with these webinars. And he also um, uh, volunteers with Ground Search and Rescue. And they respond to 1,500 search and rescue calls a year. So just a few numbers there to throw around. And Scott just put up a, a poll for us here about call volume. On average, how many search and rescue calls are there in BC? Um, one or two a month, one to two a week, one to two a day, three or more a day. 
I like the way Scott phrased this. We just chatted about this before we came on live. And I really like the way he he's looking for an average. And he's really wanting you to think about uh, on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis, on a daily basis. What is that? You know, I just gave you some numbers. If, if you do quick math, I think you could all get this uh, pretty close, if not right on the money. So feel free to fill that in. And uh, and once I see some of those numbers, Scott, I can chat about them briefly and then I'll move into the the STOP acronym really is, is what we're gonna talk about next. Uh, oh, here it comes some answers, awesome. Yeah, this is a good one. And, and you know, I just shared some numbers with you and we have a couple more polls to, to throw at you too. And it's really nice to have that engagement with you and, and see what you think is happening out there. Cause I know you see it in the news, I do too. Uh, and sometimes talk, I'm talking about it there as well. Uh, and, you know, and Scott and I know these numbers with our eyes closed and can repeat them in our sleep. <laughs> There's good and bad to that. Uh, well, and but, the interesting yeah. thing is, like, we're talking province wide here, right? Yeah. But I recall yeah. last year, actually, I think there may have been one of them this year as well. Our one team, Coquitlam Search and Rescue, had four tasks in one day. Just the one team. And there are 78 teams in total so if you get you get a busy day it can be pretty harsh and you know you bring a good point Scott because again I can't share enough and with so much respect that all the 3400 volunteers are unpaid professionals you're leaving your family your friends your workplaces your 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 life to go out there and help people and you want to you're trained to you're able to you're skilled to and you go out there and do it when it's safe for you to do but if we can all help you stay at home more, that's our goal. That's my goal. Uh, yeah, I don't so really, we, see... we, 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 we don't really want to go out four times in the same day, to be honest. <laughs> no, 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 I would not. No, thank you. So I'm glad you brought that up. And this is a great poll to, to talk about that. So we can see that 31% thought it was one to two a day and 69% were, were on the mark three or more a day. So it's, it's good to think about when it's phrased differently, because I can give that annual but i love that you broke it down like this scott thanks for that so let's talk about this analogy here that we've got um what to do in an emergency you know 1500 times a year in bc again that's more than everywhere else in canada and if you know what to do in that emergency because sometimes accidents do happen that aren't preventable even though a lot of those 1500 are preventable um, we want you to think about what you can do in that situation to help yourself, which eventually trickles down to helping search and rescue. So you just need to stop. Stop moving. Please don't go down a ravine, a gully, a drainage, a natural draw, a creek, a river. Do not go down those, those, those features that are somewhat pulling you that way. I, I understand that they could, and you think it might lead to uh, infrastructure, uh, community, a road, you're better off to stop and stay put. So we're gonna talk about stop, think, observe, and plan. When you do, it allows you to take a moment to really think about what's just happened or, you know, it allows you to gather your thoughts is what it does. You can check and see if someone's been hurt, lost or disoriented, or if anyone's exceeded or their abilities. Again, those are the top three reasons for search and rescue. So by you stopping is already helping you before you've done anything. Uh, it's, it's, it's an important piece to remember. Now you can start to think, how will you contact search and rescue? I love this slide because it has a lot of positives that we've already talked about. You already left an emergency contact, um, pardon me, your plan with your emergency contact. So that's in place, that's communication as well. Will anyone know you're missing? Yeah, you've left that with your emergency contact. Will anyone know where you are? Same answer, you left it in your plan. Um, and when should you call search and rescue? ASAP. That's a quick, easy, short answer. And I'm really good at long answers. So the answer to that, when do you call search and rescue? It's ASAP. They can then activate their system, which there takes a, there's a few steps to go through before they can actually literally start walking if they are on a path to search for you. There's a lot that needs to happen. So the sooner you can call, the better. Don't wait an hour, two hours, six hours, uh, that needs to happen right away. Are you prepared to treat a medical emergency? I love this bullet because it goes back to our three T's and it talks about training. Having that first aid, that bushcraft, how can you treat this a medical, this medical emergency to help your friend, 
um, if you are that first aid attendant. And you have those essentials to keep warm and dry. It goes back to our three T's, talks about the essentials, that you've taken them all, you have them there, you have those extra layers. You can now apply them and put them on. So this thinking stage of the STOP acronym is, is a biggie because it covers a lot here. And a lot of it, you put all your ducks in order before. Before you left the house, you planned this with your group, and this is all aligned. And just a, a little great reminder there at the bottom of the screen here, the number to call is 911. There's no special number to reach Scott or me or any other search or rescue person. You, you know it's 911. Uh, it will go to the local police or RCMP as they are the tasking agency officially, and they call out search and rescue. And there's no charge for search and rescue, no matter the reason you call, uh, no matter the reason of the incident, there's no charge. So remember the number's 911 and there's no charge for rescue. Communications devices vary. Um, we all probably have a phone kicking around close by right now. Uh, and uh, that is a device I'm sure you will take. And if you see by the bullets here, it's our secondary means of communication. The primary are items like a spot, an inReach, a Zolio, or a satellite phone. Those are number one on the list. The cell phone's secondary. So much can happen with that phone. Break, weather exposure, uh, battery loss, Wi-Fi, data, no more. Uh, there's many reasons why that cell phone is your secondary, not your primary. And these other ones, you can check out the features, look into them. I know they're investments. You can, you can see about using one and how it would benefit you and how that package would work for the activities that you like to do at the times you like to use them. So really, really key piece. Um, I know a lot of people head out with just their cell phones, but if we can really remind each other, share it with your friends, that the secondary is a mobile, not a primary piece. Your observations are key. Looking around to see that it's safe, making sure it's a, it's, it's a, it's a really safe space to make a shelter and wait, and making sure that if there is a clearing close by to where you've decided to stop, you could use that clearing if a helicopter is coming above you and you can make yourself large to be seen easier. But these observations are critical that you're in a safe space, um, on the ground, in and around the, the features that you're on, not near a cliff or swift water, not on a, a steep uh, ledged spire. Uh, in the wintertime, you're not below a cornice, you're not on a cornice. Uh, you know, think about all of these features that you can um, place yourself in danger by. So really observe what's around you. Exposure could also be an observation. If you're on an open ridge and it's 35 degrees out and the sun's beating on you, that's also an observation to, to create some form of shade and shelter. So lots of observations with those of you who are in your group who are still healthy and able to manage that situation as one of your people in your group might need help and you're all waiting and working together. The planning phase allows you to get into action. We're always better when we have something to do. And that allows you to use those essentials that you carried with you, plan how to react to this emergency. And this is when you're, you're starting to put things into action because your planning started at home. And then those conversations at home with your group about your activity that you're heading out on, you will have, and I'm encouraging you to talk about, you know, Scott and I headed out for a mountain bike. What if Scott falls and breaks his ankle or his wrist? or scrapes up his chin really bad and, and we need help. Come up with some scenario, come up with a few different ones and talk about who's in charge of first aid primarily. Who will do that primary first means of communication to 911? Who's gonna take charge of first aid? You're gonna work together as a team because uh, when you get in this situation, you're gonna go into play. Use those essentials to build a shelter. We're gonna have a, a couple of images of shelters coming up soon. Build a fire only. If it's safe to do so, uh, it's not a hazardous season and the climate allows so. Um, and wear your warm and protective layers and waterproof. And, and you know, search and rescue do their best to come out quickly. I know they do, uh, but search and rescue takes time. And average search and rescue calls can be upwards of nine hours. And, and at times that could be in the dark while you wait. A lot of search and rescue calls in, come in later in the day, which then takes you to sunset. And imagine having to get through the evening uh, in the cold and the dark waiting, possibly injured, hungry. Uh, so it's a different situation, right? It's not always a quick 
um, I'm, I'm getting rescued and out in a couple of hours or less. At, it's at some point in longer. time, Sandra, we need to uh, consider getting uh, getting a little graph that shows uh, a the number of uh, ones that have are at one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours, six hours, because Great. one of the issues with using an average, of course, is that there are some SAR responses that take 48 hours, and there are some SAR responses that take one hour. So it, uh, I think uh, it would be really cool to get that little piece of data uh, uh, going forward and we could throw it in uh, a future slide deck. Yeah, awesome. Consider it then. What to do in an emergency in relation to clothing, fire and shelter. You know, um, I guarantee you most of us are sitting in cotton of some form tonight. And that's, that's a no, that's a no, no. That's not what we want you to do. It's not what we want you to wear stays wet, stays cold, and does not help you regulate your body temperature. So you need to be in something that's a synthetic material. Um, that could be a polypropylene, synthetic materials. We often wear them to do sports. They dry fast after we get hot and sweaty and, and they, they're they easy to wick away that moisture from your body, which allows you to regulate those temperatures. Uh, we talked about the three layering system here in that bottom left picture. It really talks about that fitted base layer so it can wick away the moisture. And again, it dries so fast. That mid layer can be thermal, can be fleece, uh, the puffy jacket, which really packs down really, really tight and small in your bag. And that outer layer is your protective. Uh, it's usually Gore-Tex now, most of us have got it. And that protects you from the wind, the rain, the sleet, the snow. Uh, and that three layer system can get you through just about everything. You know, if it's the right material, is the key and that three layer system allows you to regulate your temperature really, really efficiently. Again, back to the fire season, I know it's a, it's a crazy one. Um, we had Brett Soderholm on this summer who was a representative of BC Wildfire Service and he talked about the season specifically. Uh, if you go to the BC Search and Rescue Association YouTube or maybe Scott can toss it in there if he's got a minute or we can find it for you later as well. That was a really helpful, insightful webinar and it talks about all the ins and outs about um, the weather systems and fire and climate really and how, how we live in this now. So only if it's safe to do so, would you be creating this uh, for your situation to keep warm. Um, it helps us mentally, physically, and it's a signal too. But again, there's so much more weight placed around this now based on climate change and how our seasons have altered. Uh, it's a piece that we just wanna make sure everyone's cognizant of being very, very careful about. And the shelter. Here's someone who probably has taken some form of bushcraft, right? There's a, there's a, there's a nice bench um, bed down below, covered up with an emergency shelter. There's the lean-to in the back, leaned up against the tree, flora and fauna over all of that, and another shelter in there to create some barrier and heat in front of the fire. So there's a great example of what it could look like. Uh, a form of shelter will help you create a space. Um, to get through the situation until search and rescue can find you, but it also helps us mentally a lot. Creating that home away from home is a really comforting piece to have with you, um, with a group for sure. Looking down out of a helicopter into the green and brown of the forest, it's hard to find somebody. It's hard to see someone. If you follow any of the search and rescue groups on social media or Hopefully you follow BC Adventure Smart on uh, Instagram specifically. We share a lot of these from different search and rescue groups. And there's, there's often a tiny little speck on the side of the mountain of, of a climber, a hiker, a group, people who got lost, went the wrong way, thought that was the route down. And you see this view back and it's really, it, it gets me every time. I've seen it a thousand times, I think. It's still, it, um, find, I find it really interesting that it's uh, somewhere where someone would go, but it also gives us a chance to see how difficult it is to see someone. So think as big as you can, as contrasting as possible. Leave as many clues as you possibly can. And, and how can you think search and rescue will hear you and see you? Again, bright, bold, loud is, is the way to go. Try to think of yourself as if you were the search and rescue volunteer looking for one of your family members. What would you like them to do? How would you like them to sound and be? As we come to the last couple of slides here before we wrap up and answer any of your questions. And uh, I think we might have another poll. We can put it up after the slide if we do. But if we don't, that's okay. We, we're always here to answer your questions and move on to the giveaways. A friendly reminder that the main focus of tonight was about the three T's. Uh, and, and by you joining us tonight is hopefully a reminder or a great introduction 
about the importance of them. They're really the trifecta of outdoor safety, like I said at the beginning of our session tonight. That trip planning piece is key. Take that time to do it. Have fun with it. Research it. Use your computer. Go to the library. Talk to friends. Look up stuff on your phone. Check out social sites. See what's going on and really enjoy that process. That's part of the outing as well. And it really allows you to think ahead of all the what ifs and the planning for and the fun you'll have. The training is critical too. That can really boast your experience and allow you to be confident out there as an enthusiast and, and allow you to be aware of your situation versus unaware of what you're getting into and what you're capable of. And then take those essentials with you all the time. And don't forget the season and sport specific. And I forgot to mention, which I'm glad I'm going to now, are those personal ones. Uh, I need my glasses now. That's essential for me. It could be medication. Uh, it could be asthma, puffer medication, um, anything that you need for you that might be extra for you based on health, needs, desires. It could be your favorite trail mix, and that could be essential for you um, or your favorite chocolate, maybe. As I mentioned earlier, we do have an Adventure Smart Trip Plan app. Here's an easy way to have access to it. It's the QR code there on your screen. Feel free to scan it. It's also available at adventuresmart.ca. Uh, the main um, focus though tonight was just to increase your awareness so that you're a little bit more in tune about what we would like you to do to help out search and rescue volunteers like Scott. And the whole idea is to help us reduce the number and severity of search and rescue calls in the province even reduce the severity of a call by a couple of hours because you're prepared, you filed a plan, you knew what to do, something still happened, but you could reduce the severity of it by a few hours as one example. That's still success. Because then yeah, the if, you, of... if, if you can end up uh, uh, not going out of, like we rescue you and you end up going home in your car instead of in an ambulance, that's a plus. That is a plus. Good way to put it, Scott. And you would know, you would know. So if you don't follow us already, there's our socials. There's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, we have the handle on all the same. And uh, we're here to answer any questions. And then if you want to stick around for the last, what have we got here, 13 minutes or 12 minutes, uh, we'll answer your questions, but we'll also give away two giveaways. We've got one from Helly Hansen and the other one's from Bright Source, both awesome supporters of tonight. And like Scott said at the top of the hour, everyone who joined us tonight gets one month free trial from Fat Map, which is really fun to play with, by the way. And uh, you can check that out for sure. It'll come via email. Thank you, everybody. Marvelous. Let's just knock that screen share off there. Thank you. -boo. And let's get to the questions. So got a number of them here. And I uh, please go to the Q&A portion. Shove in your question now. Um, and uh, I'll start off with an easy one. Judy O'Hara says, how can a US citizen access the trip planning app? Come to Canada. Uh, <laughs> in all honesty, it's only shared in Canada, and it is um, because it. This is where Adventure Smart is uh, headquartered, right? Uh, but uh, if you are um, savvy, or you know someone who is savvy, there's something called side loading. Uh, you can look up the word side load. Uh, at, or you can look up the word APK if you are using a, uh, a device and you might be able to figure out how to do it yourself. Uh, we don't support that though. It, it is for people who are in Canada uh, using the Canadian phones. So there, there's, you know, there's a quick one off the top. <laughs> there it is, a quick one off the top. You know, and I like when people ask about it because that means they're interested and I, I think that's exciting. And, and uh, but you still can form your version of a trip plan right? The app is just a tool. That's just a tool. It's just a fancy note in a roundabout way. Uh, but the idea is you can still visit adventuresmart.ca, go to the trip planning section and, and have a look at um, what's on there and, uh, and, and create your own little one pager, you know, just get a word document out or pen and paper, name, number, who's going with, when you turn them back, time, what you've got with you, uh, abilities and skills, um, contacts, and you know, no different than the text I showed tonight, that that still works and it's yep. better than nothing. The app is just a tool. So, but thank you for the interest. Yeah, and don't forget that the app actually only sends that information to your contact. That app doesn't 
uh, uh, send the information to search and rescue. It doesn't send the information to the police. It, all it does is it's a great little way of assembling the information that you need so that your contact has it when they need to call the police because you're overdue. Exactly. It just houses it. We don't we don't collect that information, by the way, if anyone else no. there in Canada is using it. There's no collection of that information. It is just a tool. A helpful one, though. Yeah, I agree. Um, so there's oh, there's a number of good ones. And I, I, I want to leave a little one one for later. I might help out with. Uh, but let's start off with one. Is it advisable to go on hikes alone? And then I have another one which is similar to that. Uh, but yeah, let's do it separately. Is it advisable to go on hikes alone, Sandra? I'm going to give you what I'm not very good at. I'm going to give you the short answer. And that's no. BC Adventure Smart does not recommend for you to go out on any venture alone. Uh, that's our recommendation from the BC Search and Rescue Association, uh, from the 3,400 volunteers, from our team here at the BC Search and Rescue Association, which is also BC Adventure Smart. We do not recommend anyone to go solo. Uh, the idea for many is to head out there and enjoy the outdoors. There's often goals set if it's peaks, if it's fun, if it's health reasons, mental or physical training. Uh, our goal is to always reach our destination, which is home. There's many reasons why we head out there and we should always do it with others. And, th and the primary reason is to have a good time and have fun and get back home. Like that's, you know, that, that's it. Also amongst that is that you do it safely and carefully with others so that you're prepared for that emergency. The likelihood of something happening are slim, but we also have data and we work with it daily. Uh, and those insights tell us that 1,500 times a year in BC, there are incidents that are happening from slips, trips, and falls from people who don't know how to navigate and, and, and route find. Uh, for those that don't know how to often sometimes communicate very well or clearly, and they stem from exceeding abilities and getting lost and disoriented and getting injured. And there's, there's many other caveats to that. But if you can do that in a group and something still happens, you're better off. Yeah, and I think one of the... One of the one of the things, it depends on your definition of alone and it depends on your definition of hike, of course, right? So uh, uh, alone, if you're talking about solitude, that's a problem generally, right? If you are in a place where there's absolutely no one no one else, yeah, that's not it. If you're talking about going in a place where there are dozens of people around you, like, I don't know, maybe you consider it hiking to go in the uh, Capilano Suspension Bridge. OK, uh, it, it, it there are dozens of people around you at any point in time. If anything were to happen, someone would go, hey, someone just fell. Uh, it's it's not a big deal. Right. Uh, but the solitude, I think, is is a big problem. If there's no chance anyone's going to come across you, there's that's a that's really a, a problem, isn't it? It is. I fully agree. And and I was just in the news last week about this exactly. And, and we were just doing the same thing we were doing tonight is reminding everyone that, that it's better. Off, you're better off in a group. You're going to have great memories. You're going to be able to help each other if something goes wrong. Uh, and, and you defined it. We talked about it before we came on air is is that definition of a hike. Uh, and you just described it again, too. So take all those two to into the equation and, and really consider that, you know. There's, there's people out there, you know, it was brought up, I, sp I spoke about it on the weekly um, segment I'm doing on Stoke FM based on Revelstoke. We talked about this too on Monday. And, and one of the broadcasters said, well, what if I don't have anybody to go with? I'm, can I still go? You know, that comes up as like, I don't have anybody to go with. And if you don't have friends that care to do that activity, your family are busy or don't want to do that activity. You're, you're somewhere on business. It. You're somewhere on business. Great example. You are new to the community. Mm -hmm. and you are an individual doing your things right then and there try to find a group there's 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 hiking groups there's clubs there's one there's groups that you can join that you get mentored it's awesome uh you can learn all these tips and tricks and and uh and there's even online forums that you can join to have conversations and gain access to more information and possible meetups that's another situation i believe where you need to be careful uh, safe and make sure that you're clear with your object, um, objectives for that activity well before trailhead or at the very, very, very least at the trailhead because these might these might be new people you're meeting. But nonetheless, there's options, right? There's options. It might be a coworker 
uh, make a new friend and uh, say, hey, would you like to go for a hike this weekend? If, if you didn't know anybody else, they could go with you. But the, the long story, which I just shared with you, is we'd like you to find a friend to hike with, please. Absolutely. Uh, someone asks a question, uh, be ready to stay overnight. Is that because helicopters can't operate at night? Or like, what? why Why is there? Why is it a good likelihood that you're going to be hang, hunkering down overnight? Yeah, and you can jump anytime, Scott, because you've got hands-on experience on this one. That can vary. That can have, there could be many reasons. Uh, could be weather, could be nightfall, could be access to the subject. Uh, it could be um, many other influences that they are not able to search for you in the evening. Um, so the idea, though, is to prepare for that and not expect that you will be brought home during that nighttime. Uh, it might happen. Uh, you know, but you need to think about, and, and we'll get those stats, Scott, you brought up a good point. We're going to figure out those numbers a little bit closer so that we can really see what that call volume timeline is a little bit better. And that might help our audiences to um, be more prepared. But nonetheless, a lot of calls come in close to sunset, no matter that time of year. So in yep. the summertime, it might be nine or 10 at night at the height of that uh, in the winter, four o'clock. Right? Well, and, no that's, and that's the thing is, is that the people get concerned when they haven't heard from their loved one yeah. as they approach the time. So, uh, and, and when you even, when you're doing your trip planning, right, you're doing your trip planning saying, oh, okay, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, call you by four o'clock, right? I'm anticipating that it, 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 if you don't hear from me before four, that's fine. If you don't hear from me at four or uh, then you need to start doing your five, 10 minute uh, countdown before you call 911 kind of thing. Uh, but we, when we plan that time, that time typically is really close to sunset. And that's yeah. essentially what it comes down to. Right? <laughs> every time, every time, all year, all year long. So no matter what, you know, think of all those conditions and get, that you might have to spend the night and, and getting prepared for that allows you to mentally prepare for that. Mm, I might've spent a night outside tonight. <laughs> it's going to be cold and dark. I'm going to have to keep warm and dry fed. Am I going to be able to sleep? How's this going to go down? Really put yourself in that situation and, and you'll be better off. Even if you have to spend just a couple of hours waiting, you'll be better off because you mentally planned for that. I'll, I'll do a quickie here. Uh, David asks if there's any specific radio channel to communicate with SAR. The answer is no. In fact, even amongst SAR groups, uh, when we have our fancy radios, uh, they are on private channels. Uh, it, we, we have to occasionally communicate things about a subject, and those would be things we don't want the regular public to have. Sometimes they're digital. Uh, we're moving more towards digital uh, and also encryption. Uh, so the quick answer is no. Uh, if you're out in the, the, the thing, 911 is the way to get to it. Or if you're on a, if you're outside of cellular coverage area, which must, much of our province is, using those primary methods of communication, uh, satellites, PLB, spot, uh, in reach, things like that. That's how you get in touch with us. There will be no ability for you to connect your radio and, and get in touch with us. Yeah, good point, uh, Scott. Thanks. If lost, should you go up or down the mountain? Ah, I'm going to go right back to that. One of the favorite parts of this presentation. We're going to go right back to that stop. <laughs> and we're not going to go up or down. We're going to stay right there. Uh, the only reason you might move ever so slightly from that area is, is if you're in a dangerous location, yeah. right? If you're near a slippery ledge, near a fast running creek, swift water, or if you're hanging on over a ledge on a breaking branch, you know, I'm being dramatic, but you get the gist. The idea is you're not moving. That is key. That is key and key, key. So I'm really glad you asked so that we can remind you and reinforce that message because it is critical. There's been some incidents out there where subjects did move. After. We had one recently for us, right? And yeah. uh, the, the person, like we search an area and then the person after we've come out, the person's walked into it. Uh, they fortunately came out gone uh yes. but uh we were searching for days and the person kept walking into areas we had just searched yeah yeah please 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 um esther's incident comes to mind of late right and and thank goodness she was okay and that she she ended up um coming out 
But the message in that, when I did share that in media again, was also anytime you are lost in trouble or hurt and are in need of assistance, you're waiting and you're stopping and you're going to go through that acronym. So really remember that stop, think, observe plan and just be patient. Uh, it's your job then to create that space for you to be safe. That shelter is going to come into play. Your food and water is going to come into play. Your communication via primary means of comms, uh, possibly secondary means if there's if there's availability for that. Signaling, making yourself big, using your whistle. You have things to do. You have some yeah. things to do in that situation. So please, we're going to ask you to stop and, and be patient and uh, go into action and be adventure smart and practice your stop analogy. I've got three more questions. I want to get through them. We'll go a little bit faster. Um, someone's asking, where can I see uh, this webinar and other ones? Uh, the YouTube channel, look for BCSARA, BC Search and Rescue Association. Uh, and this one will be posted in the next couple of days and all the other ones are already there. That's one. Uh, are the essentials listed on the app as well? And is does the app give information about uh, layering clothing? Yes Seven and yes, so. if we're trying to keep short and sweet. Yes and yes, the lists are there. And that's what I love about the app, if you're able to use it, it prompts you through and you can check off what you're taking. The essentials are there and there's a spot to add your extra season and sport and your personal items. Uh, so yes, that's true. Yeah. Now my final question, and I have I have thoughts on this one. I want your thoughts on this one too. I hike with someone, and by the way, I could have written this, honestly. I hike with someone who moves quite slowly in comparison to me. She's right over there. Uh, and so I tend to get ahead and then double back occasionally so that we both get good exercise. Are there any tips? So because I do that a lot, I have some tips, but I'm interested in knowing if you have any tips because I would love to hear some. What comes to mind with this one is the buddy system. And having everyone have another to look out for. And to me, in my experience, in all my years in hiking, I'd like to, I want to see the other person and I want them to see me. So, you know, I, I, I've done a lot of hiking over the years, either for work, or for recreation, and, and we pick a buddy system. So let's say Scott and you and I are with eight others. So there's 10 in the group. We've paired off. And if you don't want to pick your partner, just do the one, two, one, two, one, two, just figure out how you're going to pair off and buddy. Uh, and just say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm here for you and you're here for me. We've got this high five and let's go. That means physically I've got you, you know, we're in a pace as a group we're pacing, but I'm going to check and make sure you're there, you know, either behind or in front. And, and we're going to move as a team, not just two of us and the eight others are ahead. We're going to do our best to stick as a team of 10 but I've got your back and that buddy system can really help you. It can help you at junctions when decisions have to be made. If you're yep. a little bit ahead, that's a key. Hey, okay, good. I got you visually. I've got you. Mm -hmm. And then we know everyone's got each other's back and that keeps the team together. You know, there's no, Oh, I'm didn't sleep well last night. I didn't have breakfast. I'm so dehydrated. Just go ahead. I'll, find, I'll catch up. No. No, no, you know, and, and we've had calls where that's happened for whatever reason, uh, separation for lack of the reasons why, and it's caused issues and it's called search and rescue incidents happen for that reason. Uh, we've had people I remember on the North Shore, was yeah. it last year? Uh, yeah. Or was it last year or the year before? And we never recovered, like we never found the person. Like, yeah. They were never found. Uh, they, 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 they got separated. Uh, they said, well, will you go on ahead? And it was on a relatively popular trail. Uh, on the house on crest and never found them. I know, I know. And those are, we share some extre extreme stories in this, but you know, they're, they happen. And I think we can all learn from, from all of this, the pros and the cons of it. And, and it's, it's a piece, it's a big piece. I think I've been talking about more this year than any other year actually is this group system, these group dynamics, this group assessment of risk, uh, this group, this risk mitigation as a group, no matter if that's three or 30, it's a group and you're working together and you're, and you're deciding together, you're planning together, you're having fun together and you're reaching your destination at home together. So hopefully that so helps. I'm gonna, to I'm, I'm gonna that give point. a technical tip uh, uh, because like I said, this, this could have been written by me uh, with my wife. My wife uh, does move quite slowly 
and I do want to get exercised. So that doesn't mean I move really slowly. It does move mean I go ahead and I come back and I go ahead and I come back. Uh, there are different technologies out there that will allow you like an FRS radio, right? That will allow you to be able to communicate back and forth. So if you go ahead two minutes and then you come back, or if you're going around a mountain, like, you know what, even if you're, you're staying relatively close to each other, sometimes you're going around a mountain, you just can't see them, right? You can't see them for a couple of minutes because it's just the nature of the trails going around big rocks or something, who knows? Yeah. Uh, when uh, having that radio, using that radio, testing that radio, making sure you understand the length of the battery of that radio, uh, having spare batteries if it's a, if it's a, you're going for longer things, and understanding the limitations of that radio, like it, the FRS isn't going to work uh, more than 800 meters if you're in really, really rocky sections. I know, I've tried. Uh, and uh, like understanding those technologies, they are useful. And I recommend them, uh, but you can't rely completely on them. So uh, that doesn't mean that you can go ahead two or three kilometers and then head back four, six kilometers and then keep going back and forth and back and forth like that. You're like, it, it's intended to help you get 500 meters ahead and then maybe 400 mm -hmm. meters back and then something like that. But you really have to be careful. And it is your job, as the uh, questioner asked, to, as the faster person, to be doubling back. You'll get more exercise for, by doubling back. You get to see that person. Uh, and it's your job to essentially be the person who's corralling them. That's my take on it anyway. <laughs> Very good. I'm glad someone brought it up. It's, it's good. There's been good good questions tonight. It's been awesome. Mm. Scott, did, did we have another poll? I know we're over time, but we'd love to wrap up. Uh, and we also don't... have a couple giveaways here. Nope. Well, okay. I, you, you know what? At this point in time, I think... Uh, uh, I think we're pretty good. I think we're, 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 we, should, we should be done for the day. Let's go ahead and, and get, give away some prizes. Sounds good. So we have a generator backpack. It's from Heli Hansen. And uh, it's awesome. I showed it to those of you who follow us on Instagram today. I, I would love this pack, but I think there's a conflict of interest there. So I don't get it. And I can't and play I the game. I don't get it either. Because... <laughs> no, sorry. No, but we are happy to give it away. That's for sure. So how we play this game is we uh, ask you to type in an answer to, to uh, a question that I'm about to ask, and it will have something to do with this evening. And, uh, and we'd love you to play. So the first person that types in the answer that Scott sees, so he's, he's eagle eye right now, and you're gonna be quick to answer a question, uh, then we can offer you this prize and we get your email and then we connect you with, the, um, with Heli Hansen. Uh, it talks a lot tonight about essentials and what you should carry and take with you. But I also um, talked about season and sports specific gear. Can you name the first additional season and sports specific gear item you should take with you as we lead into fall and winter? It was on one slide. I'm gonna look over there because I don't have it open. Those two, it's under Q and A. Interesting. I'm going to I'm going to need you to tell me what that answer is because uh, oh, despite no the fact I know it, it, it uh, I didn't know the order in which they were mentioned. So, uh, no problem. Yeah. I was looking for, and you you're going to read down and see. And I apologize. Uh, we had some micro spikes there. Micro spikes uh, are a biggie in the I fall and spring, and I just. I know. I, my fave. I, 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 I honestly feel like a, a, a like a mountain goat. It, 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 it completely changes the game when you're out playing in the winter. I like I, I put on the micro spikes, and possibly I end up doing things a little bit more dangerous than I should. Uh, <laughs> but it's just because I feel like I cannot slip and fall with these things on. They are just awesome. I know they're just awesome. So if we got a winner on was James? kind okay. enough to, to get to, to get that. So we will uh, be sending uh, information to James on the email that he registered. Perfect. And the last giveaway, and thank you for sticking around. I know we're over here. We appreciate your time. Uh, is a twin, be twin beam pocket work light from Bright Source. They've been great in having light sources available to all the winners this summer season. And this is our last webinar of this summer. We're going to Get ready with new ideas for winter. So thanks for joining us for the last one. The question for the person who's going to win this from Bright Source is, please tell me how many BC Search and Rescue volunteers we have in our province. 
because this is one, who really who we're, two, who we're here for. Three, four, five, six. I'm just, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, well, Karen was the first person to answer and the first person to get it approximately right, because it's not exactly right. It's 3,400, uh, and that's the number we like to use. But honestly, uh, three people ha uh, happened to move away from Coquitlam Search and Rescue uh, within the last two weeks, and we're doing a new member uh, a member in training for the next couple of years, or another class of 12. So it does vary from day to day, but 3,400 is a good number. Thanks for playing, everybody. So. Thank you for joining us for our very last webinar. We had seven this summer. They were all awesome. Scott and I have enjoyed our time with everyone who joined us. I don't know if anyone tonight joined any of our others, but you're more than welcome to, to take the fall off and the rest of summer, and hopefully you join us back in winter. They usually start around end of November, run through to the beginning of March. Uh, we're coming up with new ideas, new speakers, maybe some return guests. I know there's one that Scott and I would love to welcome back. And that's, that's going to happen. And if you have any topics in mind that you think for fall activities, for winter activities, don't hesitate to DM us on any of our socials and let us know our info. We're on threads now. Smart. We're on threads now. We're, we're expanding. We're expanding. And, and let us know your ideas because we're happy to, to entertain them. Definitely, we're happy. We want to meet the needs of what you like to do out there and really work together as a team. But on behalf of the BC Search and Rescue Association team, on behalf of the 78 Search and Rescue groups, the 3,400 volunteers uh, who respond to 1,500 Search and Rescue calls, and to Scott, a big, big thank you for the whole season. Uh, have a great rest of summer, everyone. Enjoy the trails. Have fun out there. And we'll see you in early fall. Thanks for and helping th us reduce the numbers of calls, too. And thank you very much, Sandra, for getting this presentation together. Have a great summer, everyone. Good night. Take care. <laughs>